I would like to thank uh, personally and on behalf of everyone associated with ICPS planning, uh, these four speakers for coming. We could not have, quite literally, we could not have a more extraordinary set of speakers for this event. Our format is as follows. Our contributors have been asked to speak for about 30 minutes each. Given the time we have in the schedule, that means there will still be 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the presentation. This time will be devoted to a round, so to speak, table discussion involving our four contributors with, of course, time for input from you. Since there will be a substantial time for a roundtable discussion at the end, it might be best if we reserve questions for individual speakers to that uh, discussion period. Uh, so now I'll get out of the way and introduce our first speaker, um, uh, who's Martha Farah speaking on socioeconomic status and brain development from science to policy. Let's welcome Dr. Farah. My talk is on SES, brain development, science, and policy. And as you can see by these questions, um, in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to try to work my way with you from, from the science to the policy. Let me begin with a sort of prefatory uh, remark on SES and poverty. Um, people kind of talk about them interchangeably. Um, I will too, undoubtedly you'll catch me doing that in the course of this talk. They don't really mean the same thing. Um, obviously, uh, poverty refers, if, if it refers to anything related to SES, it refers to the low end of SES or socioeconomic status. But in addition, poverty as most people understand it has to do with money and not enough of it. Um, SES is socioeconomic status, that is their social factors as well, including um, people's educational attainment, the prestige of the jobs they hold, um, the kind of neighborhood they live in, uh, many, many factors that are um, confounded, if you wanna talk the language of confounds, highly correlated if you wanna sort of view it as just the way nature is, not necessarily a problem for, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your research. Um, okay, so low SES involves low education, uh, low money, low, low, other, low income, low other economic resources, typically poor neighborhoods, um, and many other associated um, stressors. Now, the question of what are the, um, the correlates of SES is of interest, partly because if we can understand, if we can describe what they are, and then the third question, understand the causal pathways by which growing up in a low SES environment um, affects your cognition, uh, your brain function and, and other things, um, we might ha be in a better position to try to prevent um, the, the lower, um, the, the, the sort of less good outcomes, less good life outcomes that are typically associated with poverty or low SES. Um, you know, decades of research starting, you know, before most, most of us ever uh, went to grad school, um, have documented that kids, people who grow up poor are more likely to have a variety of physical, mental um, disorders, more likely to drop out of school, have lower educational attainment, um, and have lower intellectual attainment, IQ scores are lower, whereby going up poor sort of compromises your development in ways that make it all the harder to escape poverty. Um, how does neuroscience contribute to trying to understand these processes? We'll address that as well as what are the policy implications. So diving right in. About, I guess, 15 years ago now, um, along with uh, Kim Noble, my graduate student, Hallam Hurd, a colleague in pediatrics at Penn, um, we began studying the cognitive profile of poverty in children. What do I mean by the profile? 
Well, as I said, there's a mountain of research showing that poor kids perform less well on all kinds of tests. We were interested in whether that, whether how depressed the test scores are might depend on what domain you're looking at, what domain of cognition. So we wanted to know, in effect, whether poverty kind of depresses all cognitive processes kind of evenly across the board, or whether it has a sort of jaggier profile where certain abilities are particularly compromised. And we divided up the abilities in terms of just a very simple, rough and ready parse of cognition uh, by neuroscience. So you can see the, uh, the various systems there sort of named by both the, the functional nature of the process, the cognitive process, and the associated anatomical area. And what we found was that, you know, across, um, across different ages of kids, kindergartners, first graders, middle schoolers, um, we found that, let me just make this a little bigger so I can read it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, assessing these abilities by different kinds of tasks, we still arrived at a pretty consistent picture of that profile over studies. And the picture was basically language was clearly showing a steep SES gradient. That is, kids of higher SES had better uh, vocabulary, better ability to do syntactic comprehension, phonemic awareness, and so forth. Um, executive functions, particularly working memory and cognitive control, showed a, a gradient. And declarative memory showed a gradient. And that surprised us a little bit. Um, it didn't seem like growing up poor should affect your ability to just see some stimuli and remember later that you saw them. But this is, in fact, what we found. Now, our results um, largely agree with the sort of single domain um, studies that have been done uh, before and since. That is, people who look at executive function and SES or people who look at language and SES. What was different about this is we, again, tried to see where was the, the brunt of the effect of SES. And um, memory was definitely one of the, the big um, differences that we saw between low and middle SES kids. And for the, for the sake of this talk, to kind of narrow things down a little bit, I'm not going to inflict a comprehensive review of all the different things about language and executive function um, across SES. I'm going to focus on learning and memory. Um, and I'm going to start by <clears throat> bringing up this paper from, what, 15, uh, 18 years ago now, um, by Herman and Guadagno, uh, that simply did a literature review, not a fancy meta-analysis or anything, but just sort of looked across the literature and found that, in general, people's memory performance was better at higher levels of SES. Um, here's some examples of the kind of memory that's most relevant to what we found, namely just ability to acquire and retain um, long-term memories. Uh, and they, they attempted to explain this or to it, just to be very open about the fact that they didn't really have a lot of uh, good hypotheses about what's responsible. So they said the, um, the explanation of the positive correlation between SES and memory performance is not possible at this time. The relationship may be due to the heritability of acquired memory ability across SES. Did that just happen again? No. Um, alternatively, the positive correlation between SES and memory may be due to a variety of environmental influences, variations in physical health across SES and emotional adjustment, access to quality education across SES that affect the acquisition of memory strategies. Um, and incidentally, our, find, our results were with an incidental memory task, so it really minimized the likelihood that the strategy would be um, affecting the results. 
Um, they conclude with SES may even influence the motivation to perform the memory tasks. These are all possibilities that are out there that can't be ruled out. A year later, um, John Richardson, a very eminent um, British uh, memory expert, wrote a critique of the Herman and Guadagno meta-analysis where he basically, you know, he criticizes them and the horse they rode in on, you might say. He also took issue with their, their handling of the review and he attempted to do a more quantitative, systematic review, what's, what we now talk about as a meta-analysis. Um, and interestingly, what he found was um, even stronger evidence that kind of simple, you know, a acquisition of a long-term memory is significantly um, lower in people of lower SES or higher and higher SES. Um, his account of that finding, well, first he criticizes the way Herman and Guadagno considered it. He said, apparently they regarded SES as a set of characteristics that resided in someone's personality, self-concept, and behavior. To that extent, there is an essentialist view of social class. SES is something that lower class and middle class people have or are. And low SES and high SES people differ in their memory function just because they are low SES or high SES people. Um, and, you know, reading behind the lines of this and other things, there's clearly a discomfort with the idea that the, the findings that he reports as well um, as Herman and Guadagno may be, um, you know, essentially blaming the victim, saying, well, yeah, you don't get as far in life because, you know, you've, you're inferior, you don't learn as well. Instead, he suggests, Quoting again, class-related differences in memory performance are actually constituted in particular relationships between researchers and their participants. Okay, so it's it's has nothing to do with what you're like inside, with what you're able to do. It has to do with the situation you find yourself in. Well. That is possible, and in fact, I don't want to discount the possibility that power relations coming into a, you know, upper middle class kind of laboratory setting do influence um, people's performance, and that can show up as SES effects. But I want to point to um, a very non-obvious explanation, not among the ones named by any of the authors I just have quoted, and suggest that it's a very promising one. So as demonstrated by Michael Meany and many others at this point, um, early life experience in rodents, mainly it's been studied in, but even in non-human primates, um, affects uh, learning and memory ability, affects brain structure and function. And in particular, what has been found, you know, in the most extensive research available with rodents is that if you stress a rat pup, and then put it, then re, you know, take it out of the cage, stress it, reunite it with the mother rat. The structure and later function of its hippocampus is determined by um, how solicitous the mother rat is with the pup. If the mother rat does a lot of licking and grooming and archback nursing, that has a protective effect on the development of the hippocampus, protects it from the onslaught of stress hormones, and um, promotes healthy hippocampal development. This is not a genetic effect. Again, from Meany's lab, we know that um, he's done cross-fostering studies where genetically unrelated rat pups receive good or bad mothering, good or bad, in quotes, um, and finds the same kind of thing. So. The, f the first bit of research I want to tell you about from, well, not the first bit, the second bit of research I want to tell you about from my lab is an attempt to test this hypothesis with people and see if it extends to our species. We, we used a cohort of kids that my colleague Hallam Hurt has been studying since they were born. In fact, she's a neonatologist, so she got them the second they came out. 
Um, and she has spent, uh, you know, over 20 years now um, studying their development. Among the measures she acquired were um, two that are going to be very relevant here. One is uh, she acquired home inventories for these kids. Home, uh, I know some people here know about the home, um, home observation, measurement of the environment scale. Um, an RA goes into the kid's home and both uh, interviews the mother or caregiver um, and observes various things about the home itself, about the way the mother and the child interact. And the items, you know, range from kind of clearly cognitively relevant, such as, you know, are there books and reading materials in the home, whether it's, you know, just adult reading materials, um, are there children's books, are there toys that teach numbers and colors, that sort of thing. And items that, unlike these earlier cognitive stimulation items, have more to do with maternal or parental nurturance. Um, does the caregiver slap or hit the child while the interviewer is there? Does the caregiver report holding the child close at least, I think it's 15 minutes a day, is that right, so, uh, uh, Gloria? Um, so we had these nice, you know, fairly real world ecological measures of the children's early home life at ages four and eight. And then when they were in middle school, we had the um, cognitive testing that uh, I mentioned earlier that Hallam and I had done to see which neurocognitive domains people were, you know, good, bad, or indifferent on. And what we did to test this hypothesis about the origin of, you know, the environment, the possible environmental origins of these effects that we found, is we, we just regressed their middle school age cognitive performance um, using as predictor variables these home scores, the home score for cognitive stimulation and the home score for parental nurturance along with a bunch of other variables to, you know, mother's IQ, gestational drug exposure, and, and so forth. Here, oh, that should have been up there. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna now do is try to test this idea in human kids, that maternal care buffers in a stressful environment, buffers uh, kids' learning ability and stress response. First, for learning ability, we found two of the neurocognitive domains were predicted by the home scores. Um, for language, as you can see, um, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, um, the environmental, the cognitive stimulation composite uh, predicted children's performance um, along with the age of the kid at time of testing. These, these are scatter plots that live up to their name, they are scattered. <laughs> but the point is there is a systematic signal coming through here nonetheless um, that tells us that environmental stimulation is associated, earlier in life is associated with middle school language ability. More surprising is the result with the memory task. It was not cognitive stimulation. Um, it was not uh, mother's IQ, um, you know, a number of other things. It was um, the parental nurturance composite, which is very consistent with, um, you know, this this kind of rat rat lab based um, explanation uh, of the SES memory difference. Again, the idea that it was stress and maternal, you know, behavior, parenting behavior, was not among the possibilities that any of the previous authors had uh, thought about, but now that we have the work of Meany, et cetera, um, it's, uh, it's available. This is some work showing that in the same cohort of kids, um, these, the same measure of parental nurturance and not cognitive stimulation um, affects stress regulation, affects the stress response and its resolution, um, which is also consistent with what we know from animal research, R broadly consistent. Okay. Um, so let's go now to structural 
uh, brain measures. This is a slide from Kim Noble's uh, project showing that the income to needs ratio of the family, um, of a child's family, uh, is related to the volume of their hippocampus. So higher income in your family, bigger hippocampus. Um, Gwen Lawson, one of my current grad students, um, uh, undergrad A.J. Winkleman and I just looked through the whole literature um, on brain structure in studies that uh, have SES as a variable of interest or a nuisance covariate, whatever, as long as we could find the relation. In kids, um, we found six studies and five of them showed a significant positive relationship. So this, I'm showing you one set of data, but it looks like it's pretty, pretty much out there in general. Um, I'll also mention that it's not so clear in adults. Some studies show it, but many more fail to show it, and we'll come back to why that might be later. Um, so the hippocampus, oh, wait, let's see. Oh, let me also mention, consistent with this idea that um, stress and parenting are key to SES effects on the hippocampus, um, here's some work, beautiful work by Joan Luby at Alia. Um, they had in their data set both SES variation that was known and stress variation that was known um, and, uh, and parenting behavior that was known. Um, and they were therefore able to do a mediation analysis and they found that stress and parenting actually mediate the effect of SES on hippocampal volume. So there's definitely a convergence here of just descriptive findings and also um, evidence that's uh, supportive of this hypothesis for where those findings come from. I think what we have here is a glass that's half empty and half full. I mean, on the one hand, there is really encouraging consistency across labs on the question of like descriptively, what does a child, a low SES childhood look like in the brain and in the cognitive abilities, and also concerning possible mechanisms. On the other hand, there are plenty of inconsistencies too, and um, I, I think it's fair to say we've just scratched the surface here. Um, I don't wanna say, okay, we can, you know, we can uh, explain it all and get to work solving it. Let me go to policy and intervention. And before I talk about the specifics of, you know, what, if anything, do these data call on us to do, let me just make a few more preliminary results about the sort of the, the moral implications of some of this work. Okay. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is, are we blaming the victim here? Which was kind of, I think, where Richardson's discomfort was coming from. Um, are we saying, you know, the cause of lower performance and less ability to get ahead in life is in the person themselves. So they have only themselves to blame, right? I don't think that any modern psychological scientist as we have come together as a group of here, um, would say that uh, causal explanations are about blame, right? We look at, you know, mechanisms by which people become depressed or whatever, we don't say, yeah, so therefore you're to blame for your depression. And I think it's more accurate, rather than to say the cause is in the person, to say that the causal arrow goes through the person. It clearly originates in the environment, as several of the studies, the Luby work, our own work, have pointed to. So um, I think it's important to, we can maybe talk about this later, um, to note that this is not saying people are to blame for their own, or even the parents are to blame for the children's uh, disadvantage. The other thing is when you bring the brain in, um, you run the risk of uh, evoking people's you know, automatic associations between it's a biological problem and therefore it's an immutable problem. Biology is destiny. But of course, 
much of the work that I was just showing you had to do with the effects of the environment on the brain. And in fact, you know, plasticity is a huge topic of research in neuroscience now. We know that if it's in the brain, it's still, in principle, completely changeable. So it, this kind of work should not be viewed as evidence that, oh, these kids are damaged goods, there's nothing we can do with them, far from it. Okay, so what are the implications? Um, I want to distinguish between framing of the issues and actual substance that we can use to deal with the issues. By talking about neuroscience and cognitive science in this context, I think we're, we're going away from sort of blame and other morally freighted words like effort, okay? Um, surveys in the US at least have shown that a very common view of why poor people are poor is that they don't try hard enough, um, they're irresponsible, they make poor decisions because of their irresponsibility, like they have too many kids, they don't stay in school, you know, et cetera. But the nice thing, I think the sort of incidental nice thing about the cognitive neuroscience approach here is that neurons don't get blamed, they don't expend effort, you know, they don't have good or bad characters, they just behave according to the laws of the natural world, right? I mean, it's the laws of physics. They, a neuron can't do anything except what the laws of physics tell it to do. So I think it's very helpful in distancing ourselves from the sort of blame mentality. Um, incidentally, the, the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard, which has done a lot of policy work using neuroscience, when I first saw their briefs on, you know, toxic stress in the brain, my first reaction was like, oh, you know, this is just like a pretentious use of neuroscience. It's just dressing things up with neuroscience. It's not really using it. It's not acknowledging what a work in pro progress the neuroscience is. But I actually came to appreciate um, that, no, what they're doing is they're providing a counter narrative to this view that poor people just aren't, you know, they have themselves to blame, and so why should society help them? Um, in terms of substance, I think we have a little bit to point to. Um, I think it's certainly the work so far indicates that um, we need to be very attentive to the stress in a child's environment, as well as the parenting skills of the parents. Um, that's, that's not nothing. Um, but uh, it's also not anything that you can really, you know, take to NIH and say, therefore, here's the right, uh, or, you know, education institute or whatever, and say, okay, here's, here's how we need to fix things. But I do think that in the next 10 years, um, neuroscience will have fully earned its keep in this area, if only by coming up with biomarkers that will help us understand who's at risk, what interventions are looking like they're working, um, and so forth. Finally, on this last point, how do we increase the substance? Um, I think there is no algorithm. Um, this is a matter of scientific discovery, um, particularly collaborative science, and I think, you know, there's no recipe book. We have to do this, and then we'll make this progress. But I think if we keep this community, this, this like, interaction among child developmentalists, uh, you know, economists, neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, if we keep this going, um, I think it's very likely that we will develop a much better grasp of the way poverty impacts brain development and people's life chances and what kinds of intervention uh, tools might be effective. So let me just end by thanking my collaborators whose work I showed you, and thank you to Daniel um, and APS for bringing us all together, and thank you for coming. So. So um, I'm going to be talking to you, and I don't have my slides in front, so I'm going to be looking and going back and forth. And I use my hands a lot, so hopefully that won't distract you or that will make something to keep you awake. Um, but I'm coming from Carlos Albizu University. I spent uh, 36 years in the U.S. having a wonderful career, and then I went back home. So now I'm in a very small university bringing all the knowledge 
and also learning a lot about the third world and how it works. So the outline of my talk, um, I've always worked interdisciplinarily, so I always bring a slide that talks about my point of view, because I think it's important for all of us to think about what the lens is that we're using. Um, I'm going to try, like Martha, to give us a sense of what we know from my perspective, from a human development perspective. I'm going to talk briefly about interventions, because I think that we are all interested in interventions, both intervention research in terms of what's telling us about human development, but also about interventions that we could institute. Um, I'm going to talk about some interesting exceptions, because we always think about um, socioeconomic income education as a linear factor, and I'm going to show you some stuff about, it might be curvilinear, which is a really interesting way of thinking about it, but also the notion of where there are some exceptions in the world where low socioeconomic does not correlate with all the negative stuff that we'll be talking about, and then I'll bring some conclusions. So what are the points of views here? All of my co-authors are my students, so we are both developmental and clinical psychologists, and we're researchers and clinicians. So we have those two perspectives informing who we are and what I'm talking about today. We have a North American education. I think that's important to say because we're very base, US-based, and we, in the US, there's this wonderful uh, custom of ignoring most of the rest of the world. So I think that it's really great to be here. I'm very excited to be in a, in this new, and I'm seeing a lot more conferences that are being, you know, sort of trying to bring all of the different worlds. We don't use first, second, and third anymore. I don't know what we're using anymore, but I guess it's developing countries, maybe not, low income, maybe. But anyway, I think it's important to keep that that's my bias. And of course, I'm going to talk a lot about North American research and theoretical perspectives. On the other hand, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and I just went back. So I bring a Caribbean perspective, and what does that mean? That means that I have a cultural critique, that at the same time that I am US-based in terms of my work and my education, I've always been very critical of it. The main organization that I'm part of, the Society for Research in Child Development, I'm the editor of Child Development right now, and you cannot imagine the battles that we've had in the last 40 years. It's been great. And of course, there is a minority status. There's a notion of really coming into the main places of science, being given science, being trained, being given all the wonderful experience of being in the US, but always feeling that there's a minority perspective still there. I can see where the science is going through cultural lenses that are not really explaining to me the experience of many people in the world. So, socioeconomic influences, what do we know? They start at conception. And I'm using maternal income and education as my, as my balance. And it's related to maternal stress during pregnancy, and we know that maternal stress has some implications for the fetus. We know that maternal and fetal malnutrition also has impact on development. We know that there are lots of pregnancy complications that if they go untreated, might affect the fetus. And we also have exposure to noxious to toxins. And we know that all of these things are associated with low income and low education, and that they can be associated in other studies with later social, emotional, cognitive, learning, language, and neurodevelopmental problems. So I'm very happy to be following Martha because I think that she gave you sort of the background for this stuff. Low income may also limit access to basic developmental needs, such as an adequate diet. So it might be that there might be some physical you know, ways of low income getting into the body or into the child. So for example, families experience food insecurity, and food insecurity is something that we've developed in the US. I don't know if everybody knows what that means, but basically, food stamps are giving at a certain time of the month and by the end of the month, they don't have money for food or the income doesn't last. So there's food insecurity at some point. It's not that they, they don't have malnutrition all the time. It's that they can't buy uh, the food all the time. 
So that might affect the mother's nutritional intake and that might affect the fetus. Then we go to birth outcomes. We know that low maternal income and education is associated with more preterm birth, lower birth weight, even if it's at the same term, and birth complications. And again, we know that these are associated with neurodevelopmental problems throughout the lifespan. I mean, asphyxia at birth is something that happens, and there's nothing that can be done later on. So these are things that are very much part of living in poverty. So poverty can have both direct and indirect effects. For example, it may affect birth weight by affecting the mother's health-related behaviors. So it might be not necessarily be that she's not eating well or anything like that, but she might have some addictive behaviors and she might not be able to get access to treatment and those sort of smoking and drinking and the stress becomes compounded. And so it affects low birth weight and it might be more difficult to quit. I don't know if you, how many of you have experienced poverty in their lives? Very few, interesting, all right. So when you are poor, basically there's a myriad of things that are not right. It's not necessarily a particular. And so you might be smoking because of the stress that you're going through, et cetera. Lower maternal and income and education is also associated with negative aspects of the postnatal child-rearing environment. As Martha was saying, we psychologists observe mothers and children, we videotape them, we code their behaviors and stuff. And what do we find? We find that there's less amount and complexity of verbal interactions. They might talk, but the talk is a different talk. There's less contingency and responsivity, fewer learning materials and cognitive stimulation. And there might be parental inconsistency with regard to daily routine, changes of primary caregivings, lack of supervision, et cetera, which in turn can be associated, again, in other studies have been associated with later social, emotional, language, and learning problems. So compared with their peers, even if we move out from the body and the family, poor children are more likely to be exposed to other environmental deficits. What are these? They live in housing that are crowded, noisy, and characterized by defects such as inadequate structures, toxins, pest infestations, lead, you know, all those kind of wonderful things that I said. We impinge on people and then we ask, how come they are not graduating from high school? And when I look at these things, I say, how come anybody's graduating from high school, given these lives that they're exposed to? They go to school with less educational resources and with teachers that who are less prepared to teach. So we find this additive, this cascading effect, no? They start with some sort of risk factors and they just keep on going from one to the other. They live in neighborhoods characterized by crime, boarded houses, abandoned lots, there are no parks. You know, this wonderful city that we have right here. You know, how many of our cities can we think in our low income um, you know, neighborhoods that could have the safety, the wonder, the exposure to so many different things. And they have less access to quality health care. So maybe they get some lead in their brain, maybe they have some problems with that, and there's no follow-up on trying to deal with those issues. As a consequence of this multitude prenatal and postnatal influences, associated with low maternal income and education, there are a myriad of neurodevelopmental. Again, I'm amazed of the resilience that I see in so many low-income children and families that can really deal with all the exposures that they have. So we find very early on, by 12, 24, and 48 months, you find the low cognitive functioning, you find a more limited range of language capabilities, and you find some less secure attachments. So this is not only cognitive, but it's also social-emotional. I love the work by Dan Keating. I don't know if you know it, but if you don't, you should read it. He's a sociologist, I think. He's now, he's from Canada, but he's now in the US. And he has found pretty much what we're describing from studies that are coming from studying particular families and neighborhoods, he finds them at the level of countries. 
he's looking at inequality, income inequality is his independent variable, income inequality at the country level. And then he finds that all of these things that we've been talking about that happen within a country in terms of income, it happens within countries. So it's not necessarily the income of a country, but it's really the inequality of a country, how much high and lows they are. And so it's really interesting to see his schematic and his theoretical framework. And this is some of his data. So this is looking at inequality, income inequality in 28 different countries. And he's finding after he controls for a lot of myriad of things that basically there is an inequality to the mean literacy of the country. So basically it's not the income, but it's the spread of the income. The more spread of the income is, the less literacy is in the country. And so it's really giving you a sense that this is working not only on the individual family level, neighborhood, school, but it's also working at the level of countries. One of the greatest things that he's talked about is this notion of biological embedding. And I think I want to, like Martha, talked a little bit about what it means in biology. Biology is environmentally determined. I mean, biology is, if you look at Darwin and everything that he was interested in, you know, adaptations, evolution was all basically environmentally determined, you know? Something changed in the environment. Who survived? Who did the adaptation? Who went on? That's the one that came on. So he basically uses biological embedding, which includes for him synaptic pruning, this whole notion that not only the brain creates as it goes, synapses, but also the brain loses, which is a really interesting model for human development, right? That at the same time that you gain, you lose some. And the gene expression, basically what we're finding right now is genes are giving us predispositions, but they get expressed depending on the environment. So let's always look about biology as a function of both what the kid brings and the environmental demands and inputs. So this is the way that I think about what's going on. Pregnancy, birth outcomes, caregiving environments, other environments, it all comes up to a biological embedding that impact early childhood development. And basically what we're thinking of right now, which is really sad to think, that we can predict from where kids are at four and five age, years of age, whether they're gonna be in life, right? I mean, we put them in a the track, and we just look at them going on that track, downhill or upward in most of the places. And so I think that this ex notion of early childhood development as a base, I say to my students, you know, sometimes Freud was right. We don't wanna talk about it. Or early experience. I mean, he might be wrong. He might have been wrong in the interpretation of what he was exploring, but he was a great observer. And this notion of early experiences being really critical are very much part of the way that we're thinking about how socioeconomic gets into the individual. So, a little bit about neuroscience, because I want to talk about that too. That poverty early in life may be more harmful harmful that later in life. And this is not only from neuroscience, but it's also from work by Greg Duncan that has found that if you have poverty in the first five years of life versus in the next five or the other ones, he can isolate that. The one that really makes the difference in the first year. And why is that? I think because a lot of the neuroscience is telling us that in the first five years of life for humans, in other species, might be the first three months, the first two years, but for us, it's the first five years when a lot of the shaping, the pruning, the creation, the enlarging, all that kind of stuff that Martha was saying really is happening in those five, first five years of life. So the human brain development is rapid, and to a certain extent, even if it's plastic, it's giving a lot of information is getting in. It's, it's like a sponge. I just always think about they're just sponges. And not that we can be sponges because I'm taking all this wonderful experience in and I know that I'm learning from here. But it's very different. It takes a lot less energy to do that. 
So some of the research, as Martha did, just to give you, it affects school readiness, as I said, by years, by five years, we find incredible differences between middle class, near poor, and poor in all things from recognizing letters to math abilities. It's not only in words, it's not only in language, but also in, in fine, and it also in terms of thinking about sequencing and reversibility. We also find that children for better families and better educated parents perform in school at the age of 10, and this is somewhere, thank God, from England, so we can cite some other countries. This is the only one that I could find, which is pathetic, when I was looking at, at my own ways of searching data in the US. But anyway, this really gives you a sense of how these things just move down in terms of um, mean scores at the age of 10. And it also, this is work by Greg Duncan and Catherine Magnuson that really shows you that it's not only schooling, but it's also a rest, um, working hours, food, health, um, and non-marital birth. There's a whole sequela of living in poverty that goes through the adult years. So myself, I'm really interested in poverty, of thinking it as a way that societies create, all societies create social stratification processes. And this is something that I created a while ago to think about minority kids in the United States where anybody who for a social position variable, which can be your race, your ethnicity, your religion, anything that puts you apart, your social class, your gender, your so sexual orientation, and had how this sort of mechanisms of racism and segregation, of how people get segregated by systems that we don't even acknowledge that are there, and how kids and families get relegated to promoting environments or inhibiting environments, no? Environments that are not necessarily supportive of development. On the other hand, coming from a minority perspective, I also say, you know, there's an adaptive culture. There's something in strength in humans in terms of adapting to amazing stress um, that really gives us a sense of hope, and I'll present some of those findings. And of course, the child, each child is a different world. You who have had more than one child knows that every child comes with a different sort of personality and needs and things like that that you have to react to, and that the family makes a point. So how does this work in the United States, for example, if you're black or Hispanic or anything like that, what happens? You end up being in the poorer stratus of the U.S. So race and ethnicity in the U.S. are basically confounded. Okay. So this is a study where she basically looks at different kinds of interventions for poor families in the United States. So you can have income support programs. They add you $300 a month in top of what you make. Make it here. You can have an in-earned income tax credit at the end of the year when you pay for your income tax. Some money comes back. There's casinos right now, wonderful invention from the Native Americans trying to get back to the white people. And then we have conditional cash transfers, which basically just depend. But what we know most about is early childhood education. And that's the one in the United States that really has made a difference. And we have very good data to talk about that. So what do we know? What are the lessons from the work that's done? We know that the earlier, the better. Prevention versus remedial interventions are not cost effective, right? Prevention is a lot easier. Prevention is cheaper for one dollar that you provide, spend in prevention, it saves seven to ten dollars in remedial intervention. And we have sort of those analysis made from. And the more systems are addressed, comprehensive long-term, the larger, more long-lasting effects. I also want to talk a little bit about structural interventions versus compensation. We there's something about psychologists, and I'm not sure, maybe through an integrative science we would do better on this, but we like, for example, to teach parents how to be parents in a setting where there's no income, stress, drugs, and other stuff. 
Um, and I find that really hard to believe that we smart people can think that something like that is going to make a difference. Um, even taking the kids and putting them on an early intervention, to me, it's still the kids are going back to the same environment. So basically, it's the notion of why don't we invest in mothers instead of teaching them how to be parents, we invest in them, their education so they can move on from poverty, so they can become, have less stress, so they can become better mothers, because we know that parenting in those communities and particular examples are not good. Five minutes. All right, quickly. So it's not all about the money in some places, and I'm going to talk about some interesting exceptions. This is work from a friend of mine, Serena Luthar, where she's finding that very high-income kids are actually not doing that great. All right? Affluence might be negative for your health. All right? So let's just keep that in mind. I'm not going to say anything more, but it might be something very different to be very poor or very affluent, but there's a lot more morbidity with being very affluent than there is with middle class living. Interesting. The next couple of slides are work from myself where we find that in a particular study that I did in Providence when I was looking at children of immigrants, what I found is the kids who were from the lowest SCS in terms of mothers, education, and income, they were actually doing the best. Right, so I said, hmm, this is interesting. And I started looking at the public health data, and it was called the immigrant paradox. We had never talked about it in terms of psychological, although now this was in the 2000s, so now we are. But what was finally figuring out is what's the mechanism for this? So I started doing other studies, and so this is one based on um, Ad Health, which is a national representative filing. And this is looking at um, basically sexual risk. And what you find is that from the first generation to the second to the third, the risk keeps on getting larger. All right? So something about I call my book, Becoming American Might Be Hazardous to Your Health. And we have it now in, more, in, in lots of other ways, in cardiovascular, in obesity, in all of these kinds of things. You know? There's something about acculturating to a society that it's not giving you that, in many of these cases, are considering you poor, minority, dark skin, whatever. They're not giving you any break. But at home, at least, you have some hope, right? There's an immigrant dream that it's keeping you alive. So we found this, that basically each, each generation was getting worse and worse in terms of sexual risk. We also found it on sex partners, and that seemed like that was the mediation. So it's not that they were starting sex at a different age, at the different you know, generations, but it was that they were having more sex partners by the third generation. There was a monogamy, there was a maybe a, a one uh, boyfriend, etc. So you see the effect was quite big. And we also find it in body. This is a work by Amy Marks, one of my former students, who also found it in terms of um, body max index and during uh, middle childhood. And basically, it's explained by behaviors and not by fast food consumption. And on this one, this is uh, work that we are going to be publishing very soon, that we looked at the mediation by settings, because I'm always trying to find what are settings doing for this. And basically, what you find is that the initial model, you see all the particular p-values are uh, significant, but then when we put the settings, you can see the variables that are explained by the settings, and that that differs for Latinos versus Asians. So again, it's starting to tell us that a lot of these things have to be very contextualized. And there is some work right now in Europe and some places about the immigrant paradox, although Dimitrova Radosvera, I don't know if she's here, Darn, she's not. She's now in, in um, the Netherlands, has done a lot of work on this, trying to see if the immigrant paradox is working here, and she's doing a meta-analysis right now. 
So, basically, the impact of low income, low maternal education, and country income inequality starts at conception, right? It might be even earlier, but at least we have data that says at conception, these things are already affecting human development. Maternal stress, malnutrition, pregnancy complication, and exposure to nauseous. At birth, we find the same mechanisms. This low income, low maternal education is associated with prematurity, low birth weight, and birth complications that places the infant at risk. The postnatal environments are adding to that, right? So we are finding that families are not exactly in the same place to be able to respond to the kids' needs because of the stress and everything else. Neighborhoods are really not there to compensate for what's going on, healthcare and schools. Developmental deficits are seen very early on. I actually have found it by eight months of age in terms of maternal vocalizations and, and, and complexity. The biological embedding is a way that I think about how these early things can predict for so long, although we know that interventions, and that talks about the plasticity that Martha was talking about, really makes a difference. There are exceptions to low income education effects. Some cultural practices might be protective against poverty. And question, would the effects of income might be curvilinear? With affluence might actually be detrimental to your health. The implications for research policy and practice. We know a lot. I would love not to stand here and talk about poverty and effects on kids anymore. I've done it in places that are full, wonderful places, affluent and stuff like that, and sometimes I get sick to my stomach. There's a moral issue here. There's a moral issue. How much more do we have to talk about that really poverty is not good for human beings? We know we need research that is to text contextually adapted interventions. We know right now from some work that early edu childhood education and investments in maternal education and well-being really make a difference. The question is when, where, and how. And I think that each community, each section of the world needs to really take about what we know and try to contextualize it to the particular needs of the place. Of course, we need effective public policies and practices that are evidence-based. Why do we do science if it's not going to be used? But are locally tested and adapted. The earlier, the more structurally oriented, the more comprehensive, the most cost-effective. And the question that we have to deal with, we have the know-how, do we have the will? Thank you very much. topic of my talk is uh, um, on progress in societies and I have to agree I'm not a psych psychologist by training I'm sociologist and I'm working in an institute of economic research uh, so the majority of my colleagues are economists and uh, we discovered uh, anyway the psychology also in our projects uh, and in our uh, work um, about 20 or 20 years ago, and I will um, tell you the story, the little story of bringing uh, psychology into uh, a research design um, that has a, has a long tradition. Um, what I want to talk about, first of all, I will start with uh, the history of social indicators. Um, social indicators um, are, uh, has become a movement uh, in the 60s, and they try to chart the development of society and the progress of societies in our world. Um, and I want to point out then uh, that there have been uh, strong links between psychology and this, uh, those uh, early uh, movements of uh, sociological uh, progress and uh, economic terms. Um, in, and the concept was quality of life. And I will come to it, this and uh, bring an um, uh, example for this, uh, bringing those concepts together with a project I'm uh, directing at the German Institute of Economic Research, the Socioeconomic Panel, uh, and I will tell you a little bit about the design and the results and the outcome of that uh, uh, study. Uh, then 
I will uh, show you uh, what uh, our design of uh, um, life course and long-running household, household panel studies will bring also uh, in aspects of this um, uh, uh, topic of uh, progress in societies. And I will point out how when we become uh, uh, discovered the psychology and what the outcome of this uh, development uh, is uh, enriching the, the um, tradition of um, social indicators movement. So uh, I will start with uh, an example from the US. Um, this report um, uh, was the first social indicators report and it was uh, published in 1969, so a uh, long time ago. And uh, if you look to the preface of that um, um, uh, report, uh, you will see uh, uh, questions we are also, uh, that are topics of our discussion here. Um, uh, and uh, this was a time when the not a lot uh, evidence and data were available, available. It was 45 years ago and uh, they started, we need also necessary social indicators for uh, monitoring trends in our society. And, uh, but it was clear what was the direction uh, they wanted uh, to uh, form a better uh, world. So it was also normative uh, in some way. And here are the chapters of uh, that um, multidisciplinary working group of uh, um, uh, economists, uh, sociologists, but also some psychologists. And uh, the research questions they raised in the 45 years ago, they are good questions. They, they have normative content or a direction where we want to shape a better world and a better future for our next generations. And uh, we are rich societies and we're what should be the directions? And this kind of multidimensional research question shows you it's not only health, it's, it's mobi uh, issues of uh, social mobility, uh, the physical environment, um, but also on income and poverty, of course, uh, and um, um, indicators of uh, uh, education, learning, society, but also uh, on participation and social integration of the uh, so, uh, society. So this was the, the starting point of, uh, of the so-called um, social indicator movement and um, uh, kind of definition of uh, social indicators. Uh, they are statistical time series from by design, so just informing the public, the politicians, and the informed society. Um, uh, they have, and they are used to monitor the social system and helping to identify uh, change and to guide interventions to alter the cause, cause of uh, social change. Um, so this was a, a multidimensional uh, picture of uh, social indicators and there have been attempts in, uh, within that uh, movement of social indicators. For example, for the Human Development Index, uh, also to find composite uh, indices or to bring all those dimensions together and not to uh, just to report on GDP and uh, income uh, development, but also to bring the different uh, dimensions to, to another um, uh, kind of a picture of progress uh, in, in society. So, uh, as I said, the movement started in the, in the 80s, in the 60s in, in the US um, and the international uh, organizations, uh, they uh, invested a lot also to um, uh, bring a better database uh, into place and to make international comparat uh, comparative uh, mappings of the development. Um, and there have been different reports by United Nations um, and, uh, of course, to point out the initiative of the OECD that started also with a, a, a special report on social indicators that on, in, in this tradition um, already uh, in the, eight, uh, in the, in the uh, 80s and the, the, the 90s you had the, the first society at a glance that was an aggregated picture of the OECD countries uh, uh, by those uh, different dimensions, aggregated um, indicators on development. And then um, 
uh, we, have, we are here in Europe and the uh, European Union uh, has been also a, a big uh, project for bringing diversity into a, a, a better European development of uh, um, integration. And at the beginning of, uh, the, the, uh, of, of the enlargement of Europe, uh, Europe, there has been also a strong um, uh, concept of bringing indicators uh, into, into uh, uh, the world. And uh, uh, Tony Atkinson, uh, he uh, tried uh, to, to uh, give uh, benchmarks for, for good indicators. And uh, at right at now we, have, uh, we are on the program of Horizon 2020 that are also aims of uh, the Europe, of Europe, uh, European development um, for uh, the next decade. And uh, as you know, the um, uh, Sarkozy report with uh, Stieglitz and Fitouzi uh, Commission uh, beyond GDP uh, was also um, uh, uh, in, in the public debate and uh, the OECD again after just the uh, uh, society at a glance met, made progress with the uh, um, measurement of well-being and with different reports. Also in Germany, where I come from, uh, there has been an orchid study, uh, the um, uh, re uh, response on this uh, critique of GDP as a progress indicator of the development of societies, uh, of an orchid com commission on growth, well-being and quality of life in um, uh, some uh, years ago. And uh, this has been the, the um, chart of that commission and the, the uh, chart what they want to integrate as a national on a national level to um, uh, bring better data and evidence on the development uh, uh, within the life course and here you see that is uh, part of the psychology in that uh, report they also paid uh, attention for the uh, people's subjective experienced um, uh, quality of life um, not only in Germany, uh, also in uh, Great Britain, there has been response to that uh, uh, Sarkozy uh, report and Stieglitz Zen. And uh, in the Great Britain, you have a wheel, a wheel of uh, different dimensions and progress. And uh, also in the uh, in Great Britain, you see um, well-being is uh, part of the aggregated uh, development uh, and the number and the reporting system they just um, established. Um, uh, two years ago. Um, here you have a picture from Eurostat, that is the statistical office of Europe, and they are charting with uh, integrated European social of the official statistics to uh, benchmark the quality of life um, um, with quality of life indicators, the uh, progress within Europe, uh, whether there are um, uh, they are converging um, in, in the level of well-being and quality of life or whether there are um, um, uh, traces of uh, uh, polarization in that process. And um, as I already mentioned, the OECD, um, they also charted now uh, you can go to the internet and make your individual um, benchmark and you can compare to, your, to the national um, level of those uh, 11 dimensions uh, to your individual uh, set of well-being um, and the different dimensions. Um, quite actually, uh, one another response on this de uh, recent devel development of uh, um, uh, quality of life uh, in Germany is an initiative by the German government and the Chancellor Merkel. She wants, uh, has set up uh, a priority program on well-being, uh, living well in Germany. And uh, so she's trying not only to have the indicators, uh, but also tries uh, with 100 citizen dialogues, she will go to the people to talk to them and have a qualitative enrichment of uh, uh, beside the indicators. Uh, so um, uh, this is another uh, outcome of this kind of development. So I will switch back now again to the roots and the uh, psychological and the sociological roots of that um, uh, development of social indicators. And um, uh, in I think it started uh, in a 
kind of tradition with the work of Agnes Campbell in uh, 72 when he for the first time had a national representative survey uh, where he included uh, psychological concepts and well-being indicators. Uh, though this was the first uh, source for those uh, indicator reports to have psychological concepts introduced uh, on the concept of, of well-being. And um, there, this first picture is Wolfgang Zapf. He is a, uh, a German um, sociologist and he was a pro also a promoter of uh, uh, the investigation of subjective perceived quality um, uh, of life. And of course, Ed Diener, who uh, brought um, a as a psychologist quality criteria. Uh, what uh, are the benchmarks of measuring and um, operationalizing uh, uh, the, the concept of, of well-being? But coming back to Wolfgang Zapf and his special design, because it is also a design of a survey I will introduce uh, in a second. Uh, so it um, was Wolfgang Zapf who had um, a, 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 yeah, a cross tap, cross tap of good and bad uh, on, a ob uh, on objective conditions and uh, subjective uh, conditions. And his idea was, well, uh, thinking of progress of society, everybody goes uh, knows what is uh, bad for uh, society, or I have a perception. Poverty was an example we discussed already. Uh, and uh, so his idea was, well, um, we, if we cover this idea, we, we need um, uh, not only the concept of well-being, but also have other um, uh, situations. Uh, if we combine this uh, idea of good uh, and bad on objective and, uh, and subjective level. And this is ex exactly the idea um, uh, that is behind also the uh, OECD um, level that we try not only on a um, uh, on an objective uh, perspective of economic progress, but also to uh, bring it together um, uh, with the same people uh, who are in good conditions, but uh, don't feel good. So that is a puzzle, but uh, um, uh, we should map also this kind and, and uh, find a, a progress of this um, um, development. Um, well, I will, um, if we, if you, I'm very happy that you invited me and I will take the opportunity to make a little bit uh, um, promotion for, for a study. The study is named German Socioeconomic Panel and this uh, study was designed by the creators of this social indicator movement of psychologists, uh, of, sorry, of so sociologists and economists uh, to benchmark on the one hand the, the economic progress um, and the development uh, of uh, um, within Germany, but also to have a, um, um, a concept of subjective uh, indicators. This uh, study is, uh, has now finished 30 waves that are available, pub uh, scientific use files, and um, it's one of the longest running, uh, long, longest running um, longitudinal multi-cohort uh, panels uh, in Germany. Um, what is the, the mission of such a longitudinal enterprise? Um, well, the, the um, uh, uh, mission of such, um, or the possibilities of longitudinal surveys, they show that uh, you have the possibility to look back in time and uh, do, to co look at current events and transitions into the future. So the life course idea is in, in that uh, design um, um, uh, represented and uh, for Germany the mission uh, is clearly we have on a nationally representative uh, level longitudinal data to uh, monitor the periodic trend, yeah, this uh, social indicator idea, but also um, uh, uh, as a, in, a, in a multidisciplinary perspective covering the um, entire lifespan of the individuals living in those households. Um, and uh, what, uh, well, we did not uh, discover this kind of design. Uh, Craig Duncan was already mentioned um, before he was working on uh, child development. He was director of the panel study of income dynamics. 
And uh, we got also advice, of course, when we started with our uh, panel study. And, uh, but we made, I think, some uh, very um, crucial um, uh, innovations in our design. Uh, first, we did not allow um, uh, proxy reports on the household level. Uh, we asked every adult member in the household with an individual questionnaire. Uh, the PSID just has one respondent within the household. Uh, on the other side, we had Wolfgang Zapf in uh, uh, our uh, survey, and he uh, wanted to have subjective indicators from the beginning. So we started already in uh, 85 with the concept of cognitive well-being in our survey and included also 2007 effective um, indicators of well-being. Well, then a unique uh, um, uh, event happened, unification. Um, and uh, we expanded, of course, um, we included East Germany and could compare now the development of East Germany and with the development of uh, uh, social transitions and uh, progress with, with the old West German picture. So that was also um, uh, part of the puzzle. And um, uh, the discovery of early childhood was also mentioned. Well, we, did, we slept at the beginning. Uh, we did not discover. We, we discovered it, it, but at least in the, age, in the year 2000, we started with uh, age-specific um, um, concepts of children and uh, the, the early uh, childhood. And since 2002, uh, so also quite a long time, we introduced more and more um, short assessments of psychological concepts. And uh, Isla Tromstorff, he, she was in our advisory board and she always promoted, uh, well, you have to include also um, some psychological um, concepts and discover and, and uh, helped us to, to develop the early life course. Um, what are we measuring? Well, this is uh, just our uh, broad picture of uh, um, uh, the, the indicators we have. Um, we, beside the objective majority of questions, like in the PSID, we have um, the biographical history, but uh, and we, of course, measure stability and change over the life course, and we have different top topics in um, economics, uh, uh, political science, and also in psychology. Uh, this is our picture of our life course. It's a little bit similar like the uh, um, uh, tradition of uh, um, uh, cohort studies that start with a birth, um, and the Great Britain has a tradition of birth cohorts, representative big birth cohorts, uh, started already in the 70s. We don't have in Germany, um, uh, but we started in 84 with, a, with this kind of household design, where we also have new births uh, um, uh, uh, per, per each year, and then we start from the observation period, um, until people get old and um, in transition to uh, labor uh, market and so on. Those little uh, red arrows show when we start with individual questionnaires. Uh, that was in uh, age 16 when we had adult respondents, but you see, well, we started um, also introducing age-specific questionnaires, um, first observed by the mothers, but now also, since uh, year age 12, the, the youngsters uh, give individual reports. And what we have, of course, besides the uh, family context of those individuals, we have positive and negative um, events within the family. Yeah? Mother uh, or father gets unemployed. What happens to the child outcome uh, in, the, in the transition and so on? And of course, we have um, some uh, 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 rich indicators on regional opportunity structure, what neighborhood they are living, wh where are they moving, so we have transitions. And uh, with a comparative uh, to a c comparisons to the US um, or other uh, 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 longitudinal studies like the Hilda study in Australia, you can also look for social and cultural and economic uh, conditions. Um, well, the sub, those sub-based um, uh, uh, study results go into a lot of um, reports, also indicator reports for the government on periodic uh, development, but um, so we are covering both the trends also of 
uh, poverty in Germany or richness, uh, and they are part of the uh, official reports. But besides the social indicators, uh, we also are able with our longitudinal design to um, make really evidence-based policy evaluations. We don't have experiments within our um, uh, design, but kind of natural experiments because we cover a long time period and then we there has been policy changes and then you can, with advanced statistical uh, statistics, uh, uh, address also this experimental uh, dimension and look for causal uh, events. Here you see the development of uh, well-being and life satisfaction in Germany. Uh, so you see well um, the aggregated level um, uh, on the left uh, part. Um, there have been some periodic shocks shocks like uh, 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 in the year 2004, that was the highest um, number of unemployed uh, we had in Germany, about 5 million. Then there had been uh, tough uh, uh, policy reforms and you see, well, there was also, this was the, the lowest uh, evaluation of well-being in Germany. Uh, if you look on the right side, you see different pictures for the development of East and West Germany and you see even uh, 25 years after unification on the subjective well-being, there is no, there is still a significant uh, difference between both parts of uh, Germany. Um, East Germany catched up, but uh, um, well, you see there is uh, still a gap. And this is uh, also designed by our data and uh, well, it's the East Berlin uh, puzzle and paradox for Germany. If you look on the aggregated level of well-being starting in the 84, well, you see some ups and downs, but on the average, it's more or less the same. But if you look on the income um, uh, development of the same households that are reporting on the well-being, um, the, you see a different picture and you see this uh, paradox of, um, uh, that is well known by, by Easterlin. Um, well, the discovery of the SERP by psychologists. It happened with uh, Adina's work, but uh, um, uh, Richard Lucas and um, um, Andrew Clark, they discovered the SERP data and published uh, uh, the uh, core results for Germany uh, because they, they looked, uh, they centered life events on the before and after uh, well-being uh, periods. and. Um, uh, he, they discovered in the uh, mid-2000 uh, this kind of uh, data and um, well, also uh, Daniel Kahneman and Krüger, they reported and replicated and showed this little picture in their uh, report on uh, well-being in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, then the discovery of the econ uh, economists also on happiness econo uh, economics started. Um, and uh, here you could see, well, uh, there, there have been different life events um, and is there adaptation after some years? That is a core question. Uh, but the good thing on the SERP data, you can replicate the, those results. And uh, for example, for the honeymoon result, you see the, the adoption after three years. But uh, replication means you get the data and address the same research question, but have some um, uh, new ideas and uh, Zimmermann and Easterlin, they looked not only when uh, he looked, they looked before cohabitation, what um, uh, selects into a cohabitation. And if you look for the baseline before cohabitation, then you see there is no adaptation. Uh, so this is, this is a nice thing of such data that they are free of use, that you can replicate them and uh, use that. Um, coming back as a resume to the um, uh, social indicators movement. Um, uh, we see a lot of reports now. We see those figures, uh, the wheels and the indicator reports by the OECD and um, other groups. Um, but uh, I share the skepticism um, of, uh, of uh, Tom Smith. Uh, he already uh, published in the 80s. Um, he argued, well, the big idea or the Id basic idea of social indicators in the beginning was, well, we want to shape the uh, society by our indicators. Yeah? We will design it by just having the indicators. But I think there is um, 
as a result, well, only the indicators don't bring you the really empirical evidence uh, what, how you should uh, design uh, public po policy. Um, but, of course, they, they are, have their value on uh, just informing the public on, on the uh, descriptive um, development of a, of a society and comparative uh, groups within the society. Um, I come to, to uh, my, my summary. Well, I think um, uh, in the European Union, um, we have now uh, such an established concept of uh, uh, worldwide um, um, uh, data product uh, pr uh, production, also with new um, uh, so social statistics and um, uh, social reporting efforts um, and to evaluate uh, the direction of uh, uh, our society. Um, I think uh, we should foster the interdisciplinary discourse of those concepts, uh, not only take uh, attention to the economists who uh, like the objective uh, world, uh, but also look on the social integration, uh, question of social integration, uh, political sciences, and of course the, the uh, psychology who uh, draws attention on those puzzles of uh, perception, uh, bad but objective conditions um, uh, good. How can this happen? I think uh, psychologists have the, the uh, best uh, expertise for uh, bringing or entangling this uh, puzzles. Um, we need, I think, uh, access to the data. Um, all I reported was either um, data from official statistics, uh, at least within Europe, and I know also in the US, it's a culture that you get access to the uh, microdata of uh, also federal statistics and microdata of representative data. Um, I would claim, well, um, we uh, need also um, uh, um, uh, access to data uh, that are run very nicely, for example, by Gallup, but uh, as a uh, or poor PhD student in a, a small university, you will never be able to, uh, to replicate because they are too expensive if you want to get access to those data. So I think that's not good for the uh, scientific development of such indicators and data if you cannot replicate uh, results uh, with another eye and uh, perspective. Um, and uh, I think uh, that fits also to the uh, uh, other presentations um, that uh, on the progress of uh, human, uh, so, uh, human behavior, uh, we need um, longitudinal analysis, we need um, uh, heterogeneous populations. Yeah, um, uh, and this is best realized with uh, uh, randomized samples. Um, and uh, then, of course, we can try, uh, if we have uh, treatments groups, uh, to make really um, experimental research, but those household panel studies, they come at least to quasi-experiments, yeah? That you have the before and the after and can make, can make and test assumptions on the uh, self-selection of uh, different uh, events. Um, I promote uh, including a rich set of psychological indicators uh, and this uh, kind of life course um, uh, model and if possible, of course, not only on a national level, but uh, in an international and multicultural um, uh, setting. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna take us a little bit back from well-being uh, back to deprivation. And I'm gonna talk uh, about um, how to think about behavior in contexts of, of, of poverty, of scarcity more generally, and I'll explain the difference in a minute. Uh, but if you look at the literature on poverty, uh, most of it uh, is work done by sociologists and economists. And there is basically a debate that goes between one slide that says that the poor are perfectly rational, the way economists think about most decision makers. They consider taking uh, work or not, depending on the level of the generosity of the benefits programs offered to them. They have more or less children, depending on uh, benefits given by the government, etc. And the other side, the pathology view that discusses 
uh, myopia, lack of understanding, lack of insight, lack of planning, uh, culture of poverty, etc. And it's an interesting place to look because there's obviously an alternative, which will be the one that comes to mind for most people in this room. And most people in this room, behavioral scientists, have not been engaged in this debate to a large extent. So one of my things today, if I can, is to recruit many of us to work more in a context that's of great importance, but really has been left to some extent, ex except for a couple of remarkable examples you saw this afternoon, has been left to others, not to behavioral researchers, where there are important insights uh, to investigate. So I'm going to focus really on kind of the behavioral view of, of, of poverty. And again, I want to just convince you, poverty is a major issue. It's not one that we should have the luxury to leave behind. Uh, if you look, uh, if you take uh, the World Banks and the OECD standards today of $1.25 a day as the cutoff of poverty, which is a remarkably low measure even in developing countries, we're leaving 1.4 billion people uh, even below that rate. Uh, if you move a tiny bit, if you simply move the poverty line that we assume to be important from 1.25 to just $2 a day, you now have more than a third of, the, of our population below poverty line. If you go to $10 a day, a wildly generous estimate, the majority of the world population is in poverty. Uh, and, you know, we can talk more about this, but there's something that should be remarkably embarrassing for a species that considers itself rational in the year 2015 to have most people living in deprivation when we've just seen, by the way, that when you give the rich more money, it doesn't even make them feel any happier. Um, and we have done very little. So that we've been talking about poverty a lot in the last two or three decades. If you look what happened, this gives you some sense that things are getting better. But a lot of this is due to the Chinese who started very low and have done a very good job improving conditions. If you take China out, not that much has happened. There is about a 10% improvement on those who get a dollar a day. And the rest, we've moved very little in the last 30 years. And again, what's something that you can consider uh, of, of enormous uh, importance. Now, the issues of poverty are complex. They start from global to very individual issues, to, you know, from relationships with nations to countries and towns. So we can't talk about all of it. You may have heard Bono walking around talking about forgiving uh, debt to, to developing countries. It's a remarkable issue to look at. Basically, uh, developing countries are paying an enormous, enormous amount of money to us, the Western world, for debt that they, that they own. And a lot of that debt that we gave them was given to juntas and dictators and others who wanted a lot of money from the West. To give you one example, South Africa today is paying $22 billion a year for money that we generously gave the apartheid regime. So there's a real deep issue here, and as we collect the money from the countries who are struggling to develop, uh, you know, that requires international uh, discussions. So I'll limit myself to something that we can think about a little bit more uh, uh, modestly and something that we can actually do in policy locally. Look at the U.S. The U.S. is, you know, clearly one of the more developed nations in human history. We have right now about 50 billion Americans who are below the poverty line. Uh, the poverty line, by almost all estimates, is a crazy low estimate. There are a lot of organizations in the U.S. that estimate the living wage. The living wage is what's assumed to be the minimum amount of money you need to live a minimally acceptable American life in the year 2015. I'll come back to it in a minute. And by that standard, things are extremely different. Let me give you just an example of how this works. So uh, Angelique Melton is a woman who, who lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. She makes uh, about 7,000, I don't know, this is probably not showing, so it doesn't really matter. She makes $7,500 a year, way below the American poverty line. Uh, the U.S. system, you know, significantly less generous than what you would get here, nonetheless gives her some and brings her to 18.8, which brings her above the poverty line. So Angelique, so the, Angelique, now that she gets these benefits programs from the U.S. government, is no longer in the 50 million that I showed you who are below the poverty line. She's gotten out of it. But if you look at what the living wage in Charlotte, North Carolina is, of course, that depends where you live, the living wage for Angelique is 33, almost 34,000. So after all the help and after being taken out of the poverty line, she's making about half of what you would need to be minimally, living a minimally acceptable life. If you look at the living wage, which most 
policymakers don't talk about, the number of poor struggling in the U.S. is somewhere around 100 to 150 million, somewhere between a third and a half of the population. And some of the subjects I'll describe to you are those. Um, you've heard some stuff before. The statistics about, I'm giving you the U.S. now because it's not like the other countries we saw who are in deeper trouble, but the data is kind of baffling. So, you know, if you're an African-American kid born in the U.S. today, there's a 90% chance at some point you'll be on food stamps. Now, again, the reason this is so important is because it's not just not having money. Being poor is a deeply financial, contextual, social, psychological situation in which you find yourself. And that's what I'm going to try to address today for a few moments. But again, that's why I want to impose on you uh, the importance of thinking about it from our perspective and what we might be able to do to alleviate you know, the lives of people who find themselves in those conditions. Okay. Um, one comment I always like to get rid of early because when you give, when you work on the poor in the U.S., there's always somebody who says, look, what do you mean poor? The American poor, if you took them to Chennai, they'd be middle class. So what's the big deal? I don't want to address that very quickly just to get out of the way. So um, this is a classic thing you read in the American press. They count how many, TV, you know, how many color TVs as if you could buy black and white if you wanted to today. <laughs> but how many TVs and blenders and other things the poor have and the suggestion, what do you want? They're not really poor. Uh, the most recent one was done uh, just a couple of years ago. The Heritage Foundation, again, counted TVs and blenders and mixers and all this kind of stuff and said, look, the poor are not poor. And what, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is that we can all see sort of where you come from. It's true that you're not dying of starvation, but that's not the same as being poor. When this came out, the Heritage Foundation report came out, it got lots of press, but very little critical commentary. It was just reported, look, that's how the American poor are doing. Except for a few deep observers of the American scene, those who are not American might not know their names, but these are important observers. Uh, so for example, when this came out, um, Steve Colbert said, uh, this report proves the poor are not living down to our expectations. If you still have the strength to brush the flies off your eyeballs, you're not really poor. Now, Colbert is a comedian and he's being vulgar, but that's more or less what they mean. And uh, John Stewart said, I never realized the poor had it so good in this country. No wonder the middle class is pouring into their ranks and droves. <laughs> and what's so remarkable about this is but all this was resolved completely 250 years earlier. So for example, if you read Adam Smith, Adam Smith has this beautiful passage about how it used to be the case that you were not expected to wear a nice linen shirt to go to work. Now that you're expected to wear one, if you can't afford it, you're poor. Okay, so the standards of what it takes to live a minimally acceptable life changed from the Middle Ages to Amsterdam in 2015. But now that those have changed, take something like internet, which 10 years ago was an unthinkable luxury. If now the school of your child assumes access to internet to download her homework and she can't afford it, well, then you're poor. And if grandpa finds that funny, that's cute, but it's still the case that now that's what's required to live a minimally acceptable life. And that's the definition I'll adhere to. I'll take very much Adam Smith's uh, advice here and think about the poor this way. When you think about the poor this way, you discover that the poor behave very badly anywhere you look, not just the poor in developing countries, but in the US as well. If you look at uh, public health, we have solved many problems today. In many cases, all you have to do is take your medication on time. And there's a big problem in public health. People don't adhere to, your, to their regimen, so take their medications on time. If you look in the literature on, on, on public health, the poor, in developing countries as well, are the worst culprits. You move all the way to weeding in the fields of India. Weeding is a simple activity that increases your income by a substantial amount. People fail to weed as much as they should. Poor farmers, it turns out, weed less than their neighbors in a field next to them who are richer. Um, parenting, there's, if you go to Barnes & Noble or some store in, uh, here, there'll be many, many books that discuss how the poor are less good parents, less attentive, less consistent in their disciplining, etc. And in the world of finance, it's basically infinite. The poor take payday loans, all kinds of very uh, short-term high-interest loans that they cannot pay back and get into poverty traps and things look terrible. So this is, this is the world that we got interested in. Why are the poor behaving badly? Uh, you have seen many things already this afternoon, and there's many others, everything from education to 
financial literacy to deviant values to uh, neighborhood effects and other things of that sort. I'm showing all this because I want to say many of these no doubt play a role. I'm not going to replace them. I'm going to set them aside for a moment. The whole debate about whether it's individual or environment predominates, as you've heard earlier, this debate. I'm going to abstract away from a lot of this and ask, what is the psychology? I'm going to look at simply the psychology that emerges when people inhabit contexts of not having enough. Okay, so that's, that's the agenda. Um, this is work that we've done mostly with a very dear colleague and friend and economist at Harvard, Sandal Mulanathan, and a lot of other students and postdocs. Um, we, we, we've been doing this for a number of years. We ended up not where we started, but where we ended up is roughly the following, and that's what I'm going to spend 10 minutes to give you a sense for. The argument is going to be that when you inhabit contexts of not having enough, that generates a, a particular psychology. And that psychology, when you put it in context where you don't have enough, makes bad things happen. Okay, in particular, psychology is going to be that you focus enormously on juggling your insufficient resources, and that just leaves you less mind for a lot, a lot of other things you need to do with complicated consequences and poverty traps and the things that emerge. Okay, that's going to be roughly the story. Um, we, we use a metaphor, like all metaphors, it's not perfect, but it'll leave you with a mnemonic. Think about going through life with a suitcase. If you are comfortable enough, if you have enough, you have a big enough suitcase, and there's some space, there's some slack in it. Things are easy. If you want to pack for a weekend, let's assume you go away for a weekend, you open your very big suitcase, you start tossing things into the suitcase. Let's assume you're doing this in decreasing order of importance. So you throw a few things, you're not going to take everything in the house. After thing five or ten, you're done. Didn't take you very long, didn't require much effort. You close the suitcase, you're ready. Now think about the same thing with a very small suitcase. You open it, you start putting things in. By thing three or four, you're running out of space and you have to stop. Stop thinking about the things you're doing. Focus on this packing problem. Get into trade-offs. Ask, do I take the big shoes or the small shoes? You become an expert on the size of things. It takes a lot more work. And when you travel with a very tightly, very tightly packed suitcase, everything is more complicated as, as opposed to when you have a lot of slack. There's actually real computational treatments about the packing problem that are very, very, very relevant to this. The idea is going to be that you go through life much more preoccupied juggling very tight budgets than you do if you have plenty. I'll give you one simple intuitive example. In standard economic treatments, Scarcity is everywhere. Every time you buy something, that's $10 you'll never have again. Everything is a trade-off. For many people in this room, when you buy a cup of coffee or when you have a lunch with a friend, you don't stop to ask, what will I not buy instead? It's as if you're reaching into an infinite bucket of small expenses. The person who sells you the coffee or serves you the lunch often does, does ask herself repeatedly, what will I not be able to do if I do this or if I do that? And the argument is, this is going to keep you busy a lot of the time. Um, and we have a lot of data on the poor being very careful in their budgeting and doing a very, very good job. They devote a lot of attention to it. They spend a lot of time knowing what they're doing. A lot of old research and marketing, if you st simply stand outside of a supermarket and ask people, you know, okay, how much did you spend today? How much was the pasta? How much was the sauce? The rich have no clue and the poor know exactly. One thing that I learned that was lovely for marketing research, there is in American supermarkets, they claim up to 20%, that sounds high to me, they come up to 20% of items in the supermarket exhibit what's known as a quantity uh, surcharge. Quantity surcharge happens when half a pound of spinach costs $5 and a pound costs 12. So you should stop and say to me, no, no, you're confused, and that's exactly, I'm not confused, that's quantity surcharge. When you pay more per unit item, when you take the bigger as opposed to the smaller box. Why would you do that? You do that because the rich in the supermarket can't bother to check exactly they assume the bigger is a better deal. They take it, they put it in the cart, and they gave the company a gift. What's so interesting is that quantity surcharge is not found in supermarkets in poor neighborhoods. Because the poor stop and check. They are focusing on this. They say, aha, two half pounds cost less than a pound. I'll buy two half pounds. So there's a lot of evidence that the poor are really going through life attending carefully. Uh, this is a study that I really, really like. So in this study, in a, in a cab test study, we stand outside uh, South Station in Boston and ask people for the household income, and then we ask them, when you go into a taxi in Boston, what does the meter read? Now, it's not nice because clearly the rich take taxis much more often than the poor, 
but they're much less likely to, go to know the answer. The rich enter the cab and kind of look at the Charles River and how pretty it is. The poor are doing their calculations and computing their costs. Um, and if you simply ask people, what do you think about when you buy a TV, the poor are much more likely to report thinking about trade-offs than the rich do. So there's a lot of work showing the poor are focusing and juggling very, very carefully, but that comes at a cost. So the argument is going to be when you tunnel, when you think a lot and all the time, carefully and with preoccupation on the things that are most urgent, other things that you know might be important are going to, be, are going to lose focus in the periphery. When you're preoccupied terribly with paying for food for your kids tomorrow, you're going to take that payday loan whose consequence for you is simply outside the tunnel and is going to prove to be very grave in the long run. That's sort of the, the idea. Now, a, a lot of the stuff that we do in the book and in other articles is not just about money, but I'll spend less time on it here. So man, many of you in this room actually are time poor in ways that are very similar to my subjects. You just don't have enough time. So for example, you do a lot of trade-offs. When I ask a lot of you, do you want to go to the movies? You say, what's the movie? What will I now do tonight that I'm going to have to do tomorrow? You're doing trade-offs in your very tight time suitcase. Um, temptations are an interesting one. That lunch with a friend, for many of us, is a completely standard thing to do. For the poor, it becomes a temptation that needs to be resisted. Think about time. Spending a couple hours with your kids in today's Western world is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. For many of us, because you have been successful enough, Spending two hours with your kids at the end of the day has become a temptation that you need to resist because it's too much out of your time suitcase. So again, some very interesting examples of where it's similar. This one I really like. So there's an enormous amount of critique about the poor who cannot afford certain debts they have buying small gifts for their kids and why would they spend their money this way? And I say to you, how many of you right now are sitting on commitments, time commitments that you know you'll not be able to abide by and if so, what are you doing schmoozing here with me? You know, you should go back and do a little bit more. So very similar, very similar effects. And of course, in all of these cases, what's clear is when you make that mistake, it's a lot more consequential when you have no slack in the suitcase and things are more costly than when you have more. Okay, now let me give you a couple of examples on, on the psychology of scarcity. Um, I'll give you one quick story. When the Allied, we do in the book, we do a lot of this. It's a beautiful case if you don't know it. It's about starvation. So when, in 1943, when the Allied forces realized they're about to inherit a lot of hungry people in camps in Europe, they also realized they didn't know how to feed them. And feeding the hungry is, you know, it's like coming down from mountain climbing. It's a very important part. They hired this very distinguished uh, nutritionist, Ansel Keys, to do a study about feeding the starving. In order to feed the starving, you have to starve them first. He got 36 remarkably impressive young men who were conscientious objectors, and because they were objecting to the good war, were eager to participate. He starves them, not to death, but to massive discomfort. And there's a lot of data on this, a lot of research, a lot of things written. Physically, these people are in terrible shape, but it's not surprising. They cannot hand, hold their hands above their heads long enough to wash their hair. They're so tired. They cannot sit without a cushion. There's no padding left, etc. But psychologically, which is something Keys hardly look at, it's remarkable to see, because basically these guys can't think of anything but food. It doesn't make them happy. They don't want to think about food. They plan to open restaurants. It's kind of comical. They compare prices of food items in newspapers. They memorize recipes. At some point, the researchers feel so bad, they show them a movie, and the testimonials from the subjects are, you know, they showed me this movie. I couldn't care less about the love scenes. I wanted to see the meals. That's all they can think about. And this is very much what we're, we're going to propose, that, some, oh, that somehow when you are dealing with something that you don't have enough of, that's where your cognitive resources go. Uh, they go to it, by the way, both system one, system two, both when you think fast and when you think slow, both when you choose what to think about and when you just look at people's reactions in half a millisecond or half a second. That's what they think about, the things they don't have enough of. So here is uh, one study. This is a study we did with Calif in California with dieters. Half the participants are dieting. For them, food and calories are scarce. Others are not dieting. And as you can see, it's a classic word search where the odd number words, cake, donut, sweets, are, are diet-related, scarcity-related, and the even number words are controls. 
The other condition, we replace the food-related words with neutral. So cake becomes street, donut becomes picture, etc. Now we're going to take the dotters and not dotters and see how long it takes them to find the same words, tree, cloud, that are common to both, either in the context where there are food items or not. And what you see is that for the non-dieters, this makes no difference. The dieters take a lot longer to find the word cloud when it's preceded by a donut. After you see a donut, it's literally hovering in your head when you're looking for the next word and impacts your performance. And if you go to financial issues, there's a nice study that looked at people who have financial fears and worries. You take a group of people who have been shown to have financial fears and worries and a group that didn't, didn't and it's a classic stroop. I simply ask you to name the color in which the word appears. And what you find is that those who are not worried about retirement, of course, name blue and red just as quickly. But if you're worried about retirement, notice this is half a second response. If you're worried about financial issues, it takes you longer to say red than it does to say blue. So you're seeing it everywhere from discussions to half second reactions. What you are feeling you don't have enough of predominates in some sense your, your cognitive capacity and your attention. And this takes us to the study we did at a mall in New Jersey. We go to shoppers in New Jersey. Now, by the way, if I forget to mention it later, these are not, none of the people I'll show you here are in abject poverty. They're just financially constrained Americans, somewhere between the 50 and 100 million, somewhere in there. We go to these people in the mall, we ask them to participate in a study. They agree. We put them uh, in front of a computer screen. We're going to show them, we're going to show you financial scenarios that capture very, something very close to everyday life. So your car breaks down, it's going to take you, take you some amount of money to fix. How are you going to go about taking uh, care of this problem? The scenarios come in two versions, manageable and challenging. In a manageable case, the car is going to cost you $100 to fix, which we know for most people in the, in the small is perfectly doable. The challenging is going to cost you $1,500 to fix, which we know you, wouldn't be, you would be amazed by the data. For a large proportion of Americans, is a very hard number to come by. So that's going to be either 100 or 1,500 to fix. While you're thinking how you're going to take care of this problem, just to keep things interesting, we're going to let you play certain games. And then you tell us what you're going to do. We divide people by self-reported annual household income into rich and poor, just median split, rich and poor in the mall. The games they get, of course, are classic instruments that we have used, we as, a, as an organization, as researchers, have used for three or four decades now. So the classic, you know, so some version of cognitive control divided attention test on the left, and a classic, you know, fluid intelligence, Raven's matrices on the right. They go through these tests of cognitive control divided attention, uh, fluid intelligence, and then they report what we're gonna do. And let's look at the results. If you look at the cognitive control test, the rich people in the mall, those in the higher half, show no difference in cognitive control whether they're worried about the manageable or the, or the challenging car. The poor people in the mall, when they're worried about the manageable car, look indistinguishable from the rich. But when they're worried about the car that's challenging and posing a financial problem they can't quite handle easily, they lose cognitive control. They're distracted. Move to fluid intelligence. The rich don't care which car they're fixing. The poor, when they're fix fixing the manageable car, are statistically insignificant from, different from, from the rich. When the poor are fixing the difficult, the challenging car, they lose fluid intelligence. This, if you make simple assumptions about a normal distribution of IQ scores, it's a Cohen's D of 0.9. They lost about 13 to 14 IQ points. 13 to 14 IQ points in, your, in the American school system is enough to take you from, from average to borderline gifted or from average to borderline deficient. It's a giant effect. If I kept you up all night, literally all night, like you know, with m and blasting in the background, you'd be about nine IQ points lower this morning. What this is saying to you is that these people who were a minute ago, when the car was manageable, were just like their rich friends, are now functioning less well than you would with a night without sleep. Uh, okay, there's a lot of problems with the study because, I mean, everything is controlled for, but the Americans, rich and poor, are different people. They have different heart rates, different blood pressure, etc. So there is some nuances here. The dream was, can we do this within subjects? And we did. We went to, these are sugarcane farmers in India. Sugarcane farmer works in such a way that your income comes in one shot. And because you fail to smooth, you end up being poor before the next harvest. 
So now we go to the same dudes, the same farmers, four months apart, two months before and two months after harvest, give them versions of these Sutrup and other tests. These are handheld devices. And you find that basically these guys, the same people now, same education, same health, when they have plenty, function about 10 IQ points higher than when they inhabit scarcity. Um, I'll tell you one quick study. This is the most satisfying study I ever did. This is uh, un Princeton undergraduates who, it's hard to make them poor in money, but it's pretty easy to make them poor in time. So they come to the lab, they're randomly assigned to be rich or poor in time in a game they're playing where they earn points depending on how clever they are and they leave with more money if they earn more points. They're very much into this. Uh, there are two conditions. In one condition, you cannot borrow. You play the round, when the round ends, you move to the next one. In the borrowing condition, when you finish a round, if you like, you can borrow a few extra seconds at predatory lending rates. Every second you take costs you two seconds from the bucket of time available to you. Okay, it's a very expensive loan. How do they do? Uh, these are people who cannot borrow. If you just look at rounds completed and points earned, clearly the rich do a little bit better than the poor. We can talk more about it. They should do a lot better than this if they simulated being poor because they're not trying as hard. But anyway, the, poor, the rich are doing better. Now let's let them borrow. When you give the rich the chance to borrow at predatory lending rates, they're very clever and they say, this is not worth it. It's high interest. I'm not doing it. When you give the poor, and by the poor, I mean the exact same Princeton students who now don't have enough time, the chance to take a payday loan, to take high predatory lending. They grab a few extra, they're sure they know the answer to number two. They grab two extra seconds. They pay dearly for it and they leave the lab with less money than had they not been able to borrow. And to me, the reason so satisfying, if you're in the American context, taking high interest loans is a paradigm case of the myopic poor. And what you're seeing here is got nothing to do with being poor. You take Princeton students and put them in context with this poverty, and they start doing the things that look so myopic when the poor were doing them. Um, okay, last couple of slides and I'll, I'll be done. Um, I'm not gonna belabor this point. There's an irony to poverty. You're functioning with more requirements on your system than otherwise. Your system is less capable to deal with them and the punishments for making mistakes are much higher. So, you know, the world has conspired in some sense against you. Uh, there's a lot of interesting policy implications. For one thing, if you're a policymaker, when you have somebody who has a scarcity of money, you have to keep in mind they'll also have a scarcity of bandwidth. They'll just have less cognitive resource available to them. And that really changes how you might want to do things. There's a lot of things we can talk about. Here's something that's important from our perspective. The scarcity you feel is not just how much money you get, it's how you use it. If I facilitate your life and demand less cognitive resource f resources from you, you can live a better life with the same amount of money. If I make your life more complicated, or if I help you less, the same challenges become bigger. I can spend a whole evening here tell you about disasters that happened to the, to the poor, at least in the US. Here's one simple amusing example. Bank accounts in the US, when you have a checking account, deposit money in your account five days a week and withdraw it from your account seven days a week. Now, when you have enough money, that's just a very cute, exotic, who cares fact. But when you are balancing a bank account at near zero, that fact imposes an enormous puzzle on you that never goes away. And like these are many, and policymakers, when they don't appreciate it, are gonna make bad policies as a result, and that's kind of a real concern. Um, I'll give you one example. President Clinton instituted a lifetime limit on welfare receipt of five years. Any American get welfare for five years, that's that lifetime limit. Now, I don't think that was Clinton's intention, but in light of this, ask yourself the following. Imagine we had a nice afternoon here, and I say to you, please write me a one-page report due in five years. What would you do? Nada for four years and 11 months and three weeks, and then you start planning something. When you are an American poor tunneling on your problems, and there's a five-year limit, they've built a system that penalizes you but completely fails to motivate. It's completely outside your tunnel. Now, how to do it? I don't know, 10 half-year limits, reminders, whatever is going on. What we know for a fact is the American poor woke up one morning and found themselves running out of welfare, not having had a chance or the mental wherewithal to think about it until it was terribly late. And then it takes us to things as stupid as forms. This is important. What does a long form do? 
just a form for a benefit. You, I'm offering you a benefit and there's a big form to fill. When you do standard cost benefit analysis, which is what we typically teach in policy schools, okay, a long form is another hour, another two hours. What's my time worth anyway? It doesn't make a difference. In this view, it's all very different because if I don't have enough bandwidth and I don't have enough cognitive space, that form could become a real obstacle. Uh, FAFSA is one of the most generous benefit programs given in the US. FAFSA is aid to go to college that the government gives you. It's many thousands of dollars. The take up among eligible Americans is about one third, very low. And then they've done studies. This is what the form looks like. <laughs> and you know, somewhere on page 14, it reminds you that you're doing this under penalty of perjury in case you misrepresent anything, et cetera, et cetera. So you do a study. This is a beautiful study that Ariopoulos and his colleagues did. The purple is the current take up and enrollment in college. The green, they go to you and say, I know everything about you. I know your case, your parents' income. You are entitled to 4,000 a year. Here is the form, nothing happens. Version number three, I know everything about you. I know your household income. You are entitled to 4,000 a year. Here is the form, let's fill it out together. And actual matriculation in college, not just applications, goes up. That's one hour at a minimum paid job to get people to a place where we've spent so much mo more money till now trying to convince them to go to college, which has a lifetime impact. So it's just a way of thinking about obstacles. Uh, many of you have seen defaults into, op into saving for retirement, basic instruments we've built to help people, typically not the poor, live a more uh, better, a more sophisticated life. This is my favorite. This is a glow cap. It's a $15 plastic capsule that complains if, it doesn't, if, it, if you don't open it on time to take your medication. It screeches, it lights up, it sends you an email and calls you on your cell phone <laughs> saying, open me. And the argument is that if you look at HIV, for example, where taking a medication 70% of the time is not 70% good, this could have life expectancy implications of many, many years. These are people who have the medication in their pocket and life interferes. And so the metaphor I'll leave you with is that of a cockpit. You know, when we train pilots today, you can't make them any better. When you want, what you want to do now is take the best pilots you got and design a cockpit that allows those who are talented and trying hard to succeed more in their flying. And if you don't do that, if you design cockpits that are not conducive to flight, people will crash. And that's one way to think about citizens struggling with, with poverty. And for policymakers, this is a really new idea for the following reason. This bandwidth we're talking about, this little cognitive system you have, is the only one you have to do your banking, look at your kid's homework, remember take your medication on time, it's the only one you have. If I give you a bandwidth gift, if I give you, make your banking easier, I've not given you some bandwidth that you can use elsewhere, you can look at your kid's homework. We don't typically do this. If you go to the Treasury Department, they alter your banking, and then come two years later to see how you're doing on your finances. But that might miss something important because once you've made my banking easier, I say thank you and I go take my medication on time. And that's something we might miss. And my last slide, I'll just echo that was something that Cynthia said earlier. If you look at these behavioral studies and you buy some of the implications of the kind of things we all here have been finding, that changes things. It means that when I give you a long form, when I make your bank account deposit money five days and withdraw them seven, I'm just not making your life a little bit more annoying. I'm actually hampering your ability to succeed. And if you look at that that way, we are constantly violating basically the International Bill of Human Rights that forbids us from doing that in cases where we know that something simple to do could lead you to a better place and make you wealthier and happier. And in that sense, it's really deep for us to think about and, and engage in. Okay, thank you. I, I believe that the, the cognitive neuroscience kinds of work that I presented um, are not so much action, like they don't lead to action items, but I also think that, you know, if you need a neuroscientist to tell you that children should be safe and not stressed and their families should be supported, um, then <laughs> you're pretty clueless. So um, I think the neuroscience itself uh, is, is more in a helping position to, um, yeah, to, uh, to, to help with the um, agenda that I think um, developmental psychology, uh, behavioral economics, and, and so forth uh, lay out. 
All right, I'll talk. Um, I will not say that again, <laughs> I hope. Um, you know, we as scientists and as um, social scientists primarily, I guess, we are all here, um, have a responsibility to the world that we study. I mean, I, I think that it's to a certain extent immoral to study poverty and then not turn around and work on it. So my, my personal view is I've always been an activist everywhere I go. What I said is what I say to my students, the person that I meet in the corner, the person that I meet in the tram. I mean, I'm always advocating for people to realize how much privilege we have and how much the privilege that we have is based on the oppression of other people. Um, and so that's my personal um, answer is basically that the way that I can live with being an editor and being a scientist and stuff like that mm -hmm. is that every opportunity that I have to make some wrong right to say to somebody who's in a political power or anything like that, I just say it. Um, at the same time, I'm really distressed when you were talking about the social indicators. They were made in the 1960s. I'm from that generation. And our generation, really, we did believe that we were going to uh, take away sexism, racism, and poverty. We really did believe, some of us, that there was going to be a change in the world. And the inequality in the world actually has enlarged in the last um, years. So I think that all of us should really think about how on a daily basis, because I believe that you, know, you can send a check at the end of the year and feel comfortable and great about it. But how can you really make a difference in your life is being political, getting involved, talking to everybody you know, empowering people that don't have power, and tell your students that hopefully the next generation will get it better than we did. That would be mine. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time that I talk about these things in a yeah. scientific meeting, but that's all right. Anybody else? Well, um, I, I already said it, that we have all questions. And uh, the, 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 the question now we have, whether we really have an um, evidence problem or whether um, there, there is more need for um, bringing um, uh, knowledge into, into uh, public policy. And um, uh, I think that, that is a core question. And uh, scientists only can help and can argue what are the, the side effects of developments. And you, you had also some also interesting uh, stuff on, on the, the, the uh, poverty issue that uh, if you are poor, um, you still have some chances and outcomes that are good for society, perhaps, and for the development. And to find this out, I think, is uh, one of the key questions of, of uh, to, to make a, a scientific contribution uh, to this. Uh, uh, I think that the time of ideology, uh, ide ideology uh, that is um, passed behind us, uh, the also policy uh, has to justify if they invest public money uh, to, uh, to report to the taxpayer whether uh, this helped in some outcome um, uh, and increased uh, the, uh, the, the outcome and the, the, the hopes of, of the programs. Uh, though the justification also from politicians um, r has raised, I think, in, in, the, uh, in the last 20 years to um, justify that the taxpayer money for public policy is invested in a way you expect it uh, when you, when you uh, took the money in the hand. So uh, and of course some um, uh, uh, experiments of uh, uh, public policy they showed also large negative effects. And you you had that uh, reform, the welfare reform that you restricted uh, to a, a time period. Um, I I'm sure there have been um, uh, reports that this limitation will be an optimum, but uh, I think we have to, to, uh, to make uh, uh, 
a cost-benefit analysis uh, more uh, uh, in, in doing our research, that we not only focus on one aspect, but so look also on the, on, on the side effect of our, of our uh, policies. I don't need, uh, what I would add to this is a couple of quick things. One, we have a science that's not always intuitive, uh, not, not what has an impact or how big the impact might be. And so for those who, who are looking, who are compelled to listen and look and consider data, some of the data that we as an organization produce can have a lot of power, a lot of impact, a lot of surprise factor. I think uh, another piece of good news is that policies don't work so far. And so policymakers are very open to new suggestions. They're very frustrated. A lot of things they've tried have not worked well. And last thing, economists have been in total control of policy. And economists are now much more open, you know, thanks to certain behavioral revolutions and behavioral economics, there's a lot much more openness to behavioral input into economics and into policy. And so if you put those things together, as long as you assume, assume policymakers who are well-intentioned, not that they all are, but the others we can't convince, but those who are well-intentioned, I think, are open to input and to data, and I think a lot of people in this room can do a lot to alter where things go. The last thing I'd say, I don't know how you look at it, if it's good news or bad news, you're not gonna alter presidents and prime ministers. The place to start is to talk to mayors, to talk to local leaders who can actually implement programs quickly. The mayor of Amsterdam, as it turns out, is very involved in policy relevant programs right now, along with mayors in many other cities around the world. And then, you know, presidents and heads of nations will come later. You know, they have less time for it. They have less, a, a shorter time to be in office. Mayors and, and, and organizations, non-for-profits are the ones that can make a big difference. Thank you. Al although our event technically has a scarcity of time, which <laughs> which will impair my thinking. Uh, I, I think we should take a, a question from the audience. Yes. Oops. Thank you, Natalie. We don't hear. Can you repeat it? I'm saying um, these wonderful presentations have failed to explain the personal exceptions of people born to poverty, to many generations of poverty, who have changed the world. Well, I would They're the exceptions. They're the exceptions. You know, when, 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 when Cynthia asked how many people here have been poor, and nobody raised their hand in a universe where we know that two-thirds of the world are poor, that tells you something. Poor don't get PhDs. So yes, of course, here and there, but what are you going to do with that? that? That just argues it's not worth talking about. Hi. Oh, that's better. Um, I, I think this question raises an issue. It's related to that issue of um, kind of biological essentialism biological determinism and so forth. That is, the worry is that if we try to make models that explain, whether they explain through economic forces, psychological forces, or biological forces, explain why, um, as a generality, uh, people raised in poverty have less enviable life outcomes, um, we're not saying that this is a 100% um, deterministic, you know, sentence for everybody in those circumstances. But what we are saying is that it greatly increases the chances of these poor outcomes. So. These are probabilistic statements. Um, you know, the whole literature on resilience, right? Um, basically talks about, I think now more than anything else, is relationship, right? If you have a good relationship with a coach or a parent or a grandparent or somebody like that, it tends to, again, um, support the probability that you're going to get out there. But, um, you know, those of us who make it out are, it, it's at a very high cost too. 
And, um, and, and that's something that we really need to talk about. And um, it's really remarkable to me that most poor people that I know have sort of healthy lives. They're actually more happier in their lives. Many of the ones, you know, my, my friends who are really struggling when something really good happens, it's not that it's gonna pass or something like that. I mean, they really celebrate the good things in life. And those of us who have so many privileges are quivering and, and kabetching about, you know, particular, oh, my cell phone died. You know, we call it the, what? First world mentality of the, the, the horrors of first world. So, you know, I'm, I'm part of a privileged um, cast right now, and that's the way I lead my life with sharing everything I have. And I, and I admire people who make it out, but I know that that's a very high cost and that those are the fewer. It's a probabilistic. It's just, it's just not great to live under the conditions that you were saying, cognitively, cognitively um, in terms of income, in terms of well-being, in terms of so many things going against you and you struggling the whole life. Hi, I have the microphone now. Um, I, I was listening to your talks and one of the things that struck me is about vicious and virtual uh, virtuous cycles and as I began to think about that I began to think about systems and I was trying to think about from a policy perspective what is the biggest bang for our buck we could get from looking at systems and looking at parameters in those systems that would really give us the biggest bang for our buck so for example in terms of the second talk I was thinking that one of the things that we know over time, over generations, is that children, young girls, have been coming into puberty earlier and earlier, and this is related to diet and exercise and the presence or absence of fathers. And so these things all act as drivers for some of these vicious cycles, and the age of onset of puberty, the age of first sexual debut, the age of uh, sexual activity, the age of uh, when having a child, the having young children and a family. So all these things just accumulate and affect all these other things. So I'm wondering in your mind, if you think about this systemically, what is the thing we could do that have, would have the biggest bang for its buck in terms of a system? Um, that, that's really the question. Okay. Eliminate poverty? No, just, you know, I mean, I, it's really, to How? me, you know, it's really, we always try to compensate for, it's, it's like we have a cancer and we're trying to, to come up with ways of how do we live with the cancer, which is wonderful. Many more people are living with cancer right now than they used to. Um, but, you know, my, my sense would be prevention. My sense would be if you want to deal with early puberty, you would be empowering uh, poor women, um, you know, women who are at risk for getting pregnant to have a different worldview, all right? So I would start the earlier, the better. I would start with prevention programs, and I would start with not education necessarily, but opening opportunities. So that's why I love the notion of investing in parents so kids can have a better life. Um, and really thinking that if we get parents out of poverty and they can live lives that are not necessarily so demanding that their kids will do better. So my sense is early prenatal second grade interventions for something that is going to happen in, at, when they are 15. I think when you ask about the bank for the buck, uh, you know, I don't know what the buck is exactly. I mean, some, a lot of things you could do don't cost anything. You know, for, for Clinton to have devised the welfare system differently, it would not have cost more or less. It would have just been different. For banks to deposit and take money the same number of days a week is cost-free. Uh, the U.S. does a lot of uh, professional training for the poor. The professional training courses begin the first of the month, three sections. And we always know that after week two or three, many of the students drop out. 
because life is complicated. Imagine if instead you, you had a course begin and the section started the first of the month, the 10th, and the 20th. So now when I don't have childcare or I don't have transportation and I miss a class, I can get the next wave, the same class the following week. That doesn't cost more or less, it's just a different design that's sort of you know, scarcity proof and it can make lives, pe people's lives a lot better. So I think some programs can be very costly and others, if you bring behavioral insight, could be very effective without incurring any cost at all. It's just a different way of thinking about what works and doesn't. I regret, especially seeing colleagues in the audience with questions, to uh, play my administrative role and point out that uh, we'll be running out of time 11 minutes ago. <laughs> so I think what we should do is to uh, thank our speakers one more time for getting this convention off to a very remarkable start. Thank you.